Jonathan Schrager for Stretty News TV and I'm joined today by former Manchester United chairman between the years of 1980-2003, Martin Edwards. Uh, Martin's just released um, his autobiography uh, a few months ago, it's Manchester United and Me, Red Glory, which I'll put a link in the description as well. Uh, it's a fantastic read, especially for younger United fans who want to know more about the rich history of the club uh, and why we are the kind of global powerhouse that we currently are. Uh, and obviously I'm joined today by Martin himself in the uh, nice leafy surroundings here of, of Alderley Edge. He's very kindly given up some time to, to discuss a few kind of elements of the book. So uh, thanks for, for being with us today, Martin. Your recent uh, autobiography came out... Um, which many United fans have been very excited about in terms of you being able to kind of give insights into the club in, in such kind of prestigious decades. Um, I suppose the first question, the obvious question, is why now in 2017? Well, I think it coincided with me getting to the age of 70 and getting a letter from uh, Robert Sellers, the, the author, um, or the writer, shall I say, and he said, you know, why haven't I written a book? It would be exciting. People would like to know the inside. And I suppose my mother died of dementia this year, and I suppose I thought, well, if I don't do it soon, um, I'll forget everything and I'll never be able to do it. Uh, so if I'm going to do it, I should do it now. And I thought, well, a lot of people had said to me, I should tell a story because, you know, a lot of stories to tell over a long period of time. So uh, I decided to do it. Yeah. Fantastic, and I suppose I mean, I've read it, it's brilliant, and United fans, shall we say younger United fans, um, might not fully be aware or fully appreciate your kind of integral role, really, in United's history, um, but it is a, it is a must-read, really, if you if you are a United fan, in terms of wanting to know a little bit more about the, the, the decades of success and why the club is such a juggernaut currently. Um for yourself, how's the feedback been, the preliminary feedback? Feed, feedback's been very good. and I mean, I've had a lot of people in the game have read it. In fact, I got a, a text this morning from Rick Parry, yeah. the ex-chief exec of the uh, Premier League, saying how much he enjoyed reading the book. Yeah. And it's things like that. I mean, Edward Friedman rang me, who was our commercial manager during the time, and thanked me for saying some kind words about him. So things like that are sort of important, and, and, and I'm pleased. But generally, it's had fairly good good reviews and people have enjoyed it. I think it's a bit different to mo most books are written either by the man ex-managers or ex-players. Not many people do it from the inside, from the boardroom point of view. So it's just a little bit different. It's a different. It's coming from a different aspect, really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, I suppose there's so much I want to ask you, but we'll start with... I suppose the beginning of yourself, Manchester United, it, it wasn't obviously just yourself, it was kind of uh, hereditary. Um, you inherited your late father, Louis, um, who passed away in 1980, and then obviously you succeeded him. Can I ask just a little bit, sort of backtracking before you became chairman, it, it was, was it in your blood from a footballing perspective? Presumably your father... Uh, had an affinity for United, not just as, from a business perspective. Were you a United fan? Did you feel destined to be part of the club in some way? Well, when I was very young, my father and mother used to go to United, and I and I, they'd always bring the program home on a Saturday, and I used to sort of look at the pictures and the program and all the rest of it. And they took me to my first game when I was seven, in 1952. Um, but then I didn't I didn't go for many years, um, but. I've always been keen on sport. Even when I was school, I went away to boarding school. I didn't play soccer, but I played rugby and cricket and the, the school teams and things. And I, and I loved all sport, always did. But I became a supporter in 1958. My father went on the board the day after the Munich air crash. So in the holidays after that, I used to go in the director's box, as, obviously as a guest of my father, uh, from sort of uh, March when I came home from school, 1958. So I became a, a real supporter in 1958 and got very, very keen and, and sort of uh, remember that era very well, you know, Alec Dawson and Albert Quicksall and Warren Bradley and all the forwards of that time. Yeah. That's when I really got, got, got into it, really. And I suppose, we're, and then obviously, so you mentioned 1958 when he... When he sort of became a member of the board and in 65 he becomes the chairman um and he kind of presides over a, another rich period in, in the club's history 1968 of course win the first european cup um for yourself growing up and witnessing 
uh, one of the, the most famous clubs in the world from such a close perspective. It must have been very special as a youngster as well, witnessing that. Well, I was, I was very privileged, obviously, because I, I know... I used to go to the away games, school holidays, on the team coach yeah. with my father from sort of 12. So I saw all that team, and of course, after Munich, that how Busby rebuilt that team. And of course, winning the cup in 63 was a big thing. That was the first trophy after Munich. And then, of course, we won the league in 65 and 67. And, and, and the culmination of, of, of everything was winning the European Cup in 68, because it was exactly 10 years after Munich. And, of course, two, two players who were in the crash, Bobby Charlton and Bill Fawkes, played in that final. So it was very emotional, emotional for them, emotional for Matt and, 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 and for the club, really. So it, it was a tremendous, uh, tremendous period in the club's history and a very exciting team in the 60s with Law Best and Charlton, three European footballers of the year, all in the same team. So anybody who followed United in that period was very privileged. Absolutely. And you say, obviously, you um, you went to your first game when you were seven and and then obviously with, with your dad's position within the club, that enabled you to have that insight and, and that closeness to the team. Did that then foster that passion for United, which ultimately would would prompt you or lead you to want to be a part of the club in some way thereafter? Well, I also, um, we won the European Cup in 68. In 1970, my father brought me on the board and I was only 24 years old then. So, uh, and I was dead, dead, dead keen, you know what I mean? So uh, by the time my father died, you know, in 1960, sorry, in, in 1980, I'd been on the board for 10 years. I, I went on the board in 70. So I'd had 10 years experience as a director, which, you know, by that time, I was ready, and it was something I wanted to do. I decided that I wanted to make Manchester United my, my, my life by then. Yeah. And can I just ask as well, from the perspective of a young lad as well, who'd kind of, you know, his entrance into the club via his father, and footballers are such a coveted profession, I suppose, you know, that everyone perceives it to be, you know, the, the glitz and glamour of being a footballer, certainly with the likes of Best and, and you'd have grown up seeing all that. Yourself being a young man who was on the board of Manchester United, I mean, it must have been an amazing role to have. Did you ever view it in the way of you kind of wanted to be near the players as well in terms of the, the fun that the players would have? Well, I used to go on in the early years. I used to go on tour with the, the, the players. So I could always remember when Father was still chairman, I remember going on tour, getting to know the players reasonably well. But there was, a, there was always a, a gap then between directors and, 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 and players. That was always there. But I enjoyed those early years and, 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 and seeing the players enjoy themselves, the way they behaved and everything. Yes, I suppose it was all, all part of it. Yeah. But once I, once I did become chairman, then I did have to distance myself a little bit because you can't be out socialising with them one minute and then arguing with them over contracts the uh, the next minute. So you know what I mean? It, it, yeah. So, but but uh, but uh, yeah, I saw I saw things at close quarters. Let's put it that way. And um, obviously, without getting anyone into hot water, you know, into into bother, any any fun stories because it's it's renowned to be certainly compared to the nowadays when footballs are it's sort of very sanitised and regimented. It was renowned those days for being more liberal and players enjoy themselves off the pitch. Any any kind of insights that you're well, at liberty to discuss? Probably not liberty to discuss, but you, but you are quite right. In those days, I mean, the press wasn't as intrusive as it is today. And players would get up to the odd hijinks and, and, and the things as you do on, on, on tours and things. I can always remember a lot of my famous sportsmen, if they were living uh, today, they would have been all been exposed uh, years ago when you saw the problems people like Ian Botham had, whereas people like Dennis Compton years before, they got away with hijinks and things. So uh, the world has, 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 has changed a little bit now. Yeah. yeah. And what, I suppose the obvious question, what was, what was it like seeing Georgie Best at his peak? I mean, he, he lived every male's dream in some ways. He did, uh, but George, I remember George when he first came, of course, he was sort of 15 years old, and he got in the team when he was uh, 17, uh, and I remember his debut against West Brom, and I remember him becoming, and he, he, he was rested, and he came back against Burnley and scored. I remember all those, and of course, 
In his younger days, George didn't didn't drive, and I used to drop him off at the uh, after matches, after evening matches. I used to drop him off at the the bowling uh, alley at, at, at Stretford. Right. So uh, you know, I knew George quite well. He, he was one year younger than me, yeah. exactly. So uh, you know, he was he was my era, and to watch George grow up as a player, I mean, he was a fantastic player. Yeah. And, of course, in the early days, nobody knew how he would turn out. I mean, obviously, he had a problem with drink later years and all the rest of it. But when he first came in, he was very quiet and very shy and, and very very unassuming off the field. Obviously, on, on the field, he was he was George Best. He was exciting and, 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 and uh, uh, you, know, you know, wasn't quiet at all. Uh, but off the field, he was always very quiet and shy. It was only years later that, that, that uh, probably with the fame and everything else, that, that changed him slightly yeah. and uh, it became a bit extrovert off the field. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose then, sort of fast forwarding a little bit to, to then when, obviously, late Father Louis passed away, you, you succeeded him. Do you remember any any kind of vocal ob- objectors at the time in terms of you're still a relatively young man 34 you would have been then um possibly people claiming you'd only in succeeded your father obviously through privilege were there people that said why why should this man be the chairman of manchester united yeah i mean i, I wasn't always um, party to it but but i, I remember at the time uh, when father passed away uh, les olive the secretary approached me and said that the directors had had a meeting uh, without me then, and decided that they thought that Matt should take over as, as uh, chairman. And uh, I said I didn't think that that was right, because Matt at the time was coming up to 70, or was 70. I was 34. I'd been running um, a large uh, part of the, the, the my father's meat business, and I'd had a, a, a thousand employees and a turnover of 10 million, so I was used to running a fairly large uh, company or business and I just felt that with my experience of the board of 10 years plus my business knowledge I felt I was ready uh, to do it rather than say Matt coming in taking over at 70 so I, I, I opposed that they reconvened another meeting of the directors discussed it and thought well they listened to what I said and they said right well they would make me chairman and Sir Matt's president and that was the way they got round the, the difficulty of that. But of course, a lot of people did feel that I was young, uh, I'd inherited it, um, I hadn't been involved full time in football, and therefore was I qualified to do it. Mm-hmm. So I was aware that there were doubters mm-hmm. and that there was some, some opposition to it. But I just felt in my own self that I was confident enough to do it. And it was the right, the right time, and, and, and uh, you know, it, it's now or never. So, so I was anxious to do it. And obviously, the, the 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 subsequent success and decades of success have vindicated that choice. Then, um, uh, so then you, so you're coming in in 1980, and I suppose that the first obvious question is, did you feel pressure to succeed your father because he had uh, presided over such a period of success in terms of United rebuilding after Munich? Um, and then you come in, the club has, has struggled for some years. We haven't won the title Seven. since 67, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, you must have felt, did you feel that immediate pressure? Uh, I felt some pressure, but uh, again, um, it might have been worse if we'd been really successful at the time. Don't forget, you're quite right, we won the title in 67, the European Cup in 68. We then went till 77 before we won another trophy, which was the, the FA Cup. So we hadn't been that successful in terms of trophies. We, you know, we were pretty high in the league. Um, so there, was, there wasn't, as I was coming in and taking over, something that was a roaring success at the time, and I had to maintain it. I, I knew that, that, that I was a young man coming in. I felt I could improve it, but I also felt that I had a bit of time to, to improve it. You know what I mean? I did, so I didn't feel an immediate pressure. Right. No. Yeah. It was years later that I did, when we went another 13 years without winning with the league. The pressure mounts the longer you go without without the success. And, but what about from, uh, I suppose then from the the family perspective, did you feel to, to succeed your father and, and almost improve upon what he was able to achieve? Did you feel personally, did you feel that 
Yeah, well, I knew I, yeah, I, I, that's something I wanted to do. But the other thing that, that, that people forget is that in 1978, two years before Father died, I'd approached the vice chairman, Alan Gibson, and I personally bought his shares, which was 24% of the club at the time. Yeah. Added to the shares that I'd got from my father, or my father had given me before he died, that gave me a significant holding. So I was already the major shareholder before father died. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I knew where I wanted to be yeah. in the longer term. I sort of thought that out in my own mind. So I was ready for the challenge, and, and I knew that, or, or my ambition in time was to improve on the record of, of my father. Yeah. And before we kind of delve into your your tenure at United. I wanted to ask, you know, sometimes a criticism that has been levelled at you from maybe a hardcore segment of the fan base was that, you know, certainly in, in light of the Murdoch bid and things like that, which we'll, we'll go on to discuss, but was that you viewed the, the club as a business and, and sometimes maybe the fans don't distinguish because they're so emotionally invested yes. into something. Uh, that obviously you had a, a business obligation to the club as well. Yeah. Uh, do you think maybe that has contributed to you being a little bit maybe underappreciated at times for, for what is quite astounding, really, what you were able to achieve in your decades at the club? Yeah, but I, I, I think that I had to be business-minded because in those days, when I took over from Manchester United in uh, 1980, the turnover was just over £2 million. The profit my first year was 210000 Two hundred ten thousand doesn't buy you very much, even in those days. And years later, for years after that, one year we'd make money, the next we'd lose money. The rest of it. We were not a profitable club. Yeah. Um, we also had to develop a stadium, mm -hmm. and over years, as it, as it incidents occurred over the years, for instance, you know, Heisel, uh, Bradford Fire, yeah. um, Hillsborough, all these things, mm -hmm. and football clubs were forced to go. Uh, all stadium, we had to put a lot of money into building stadiums and things. Mm -hmm. So I had to make it commercial. I had to make it a business. Uh, otherwise, how do you buy players? How do you uh, compete on a wage level? How do you build a new stadium and things like that? So it was important that Manchester United was 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 a business and was commercialised because that also gave us the advantages that we accrued later on that made us successful as we were. Absolutely. And do you think maybe... The certain, uh, yeah, to answer your question, yeah. So I think that probably did go against me yeah. because I was considered more on the business side than the football side. But I can assure you that nothing gave me greater pleasure yeah. than winning trophies. I mean, that was always the the end result. You know, by being successful commercially, you hope that that would lead to winning trophies. And if you say to me, what would I rather have, uh, a, a trophy on on one side or, or, or an accolade for... for being a good businessman, I'd always pick the trophies because that's where the glamour is. Yeah, and but do you think because because of things like latterly the the Murdoch um, bid and and the way he was perceived, and do you think maybe that's why fans weren't able to distinguish from perceiving you in a certain way when, when well, really it was underpinned by passion? Well, I think people always assume that I wanted to was always a seller. Don't forget that, that, that when you go back to uh, Maxwell, uh, Knighton, uh, the B Sky B, Murdoch, and everybody says Murdoch, it was B Sky B. You know, they all approached me. Yeah. I didn't approach them to, to sell Manchester United. Those were all approaches, yeah. and they were all considered in their own right. Yeah. And for different reasons, they all failed. All for different reasons, all three totally different reasons. Yeah. They, all, they all failed. But I wasn't sort of sticking a great big sign up saying for sale. Yeah. Because we were successful, we were approached. And yeah. we had to deal with those approaches. And you kind of mentioned there the sort of night and, and the Maxwell. When you look back in retrospect, obviously those bids were made at times when the club wasn't flourishing yeah. to the same degree. Yeah. Uh, and you kind of look at the, the figures now and they seem very kind of paltry when you look at them now. Yeah. You must look back in hindsight and, and be thankful in a certain way that those never did go through. Well, they're all totally different. I mean, if you take Maxwell, Maxwell approached me 
And I had a meeting and nothing happened. You know, we never, it never went anywhere. And there was 10 days of, of, of massive publicity. All that Max was taking over, Edwards is selling, Edward, all this sort of thing. It all came to nothing. But I had to just sit there for 10 days and take it all. And as soon as I met Maxwell, I realised that nothing was going to happen. He wasn't the right man and all the rest of it. But that's all explained in the book. Yeah. With regards to Knighton, that was a difficult period for us because... We knew we had to build, it was 89, mm -hmm. it was just after the, well, the, the, the instance, the Bradford fire, the uh, uh, Hillsborough and all the rest of it. We knew we had to build a strip for them, we had to go all-seater. So to go all-seater, we had to knock the stand down. We knew it was going to cost about 10 million to replace that stand. Mm -hmm. We hadn't got the 10 million in the kitty. Michael Knighton approached me to buy my shares, but the attraction of the, it wasn't the offer, was the attraction was that he was going to build a Stratford End as part of the deal. Right. I couldn't at that stage, honestly, have turned that down mm -hmm. and held my hands up to the supporters and said, I've, I've turned it down, but we can't afford to build the, the Stratford End. Mm -hmm. The, the Knighton deal fell down for other reasons, because of financial and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. but within two years we had to float. Because because we hadn't got the money from the Knighton deal to build the Stratford End, the only way we could raise the money was by flotation. So we did float within two years. The flotation wasn't popular either. Knighton, Knighton, the Knighton deal, I think, was popular because he came on the field and everybody thought, oh, this is, this is the man, you know, and all the rest of it. It didn't work out that way. But afterwards, when we floated, the float wasn't popular either. But we had to do something to raise the money to build the Stratford End. No, absolutely. And do you think that's part of just sort of tailing back to the book a little bit? We discussed a little bit off camera about, you know, I asked you and, and I opened it as well in, in the interview, why now? Um, do you think that's that's something that you've really enjoyed the process of this book, that you've been able to, that transparency of why things happen? Because maybe there's there was some misunderstanding then with football exactly. uh, football fans. Exactly, and that probably gives me the, the, the yeah, the, Probably the biggest reason for doing it is that there are some misconceived or misconceptions along the way as to why certain decisions were, were, were made. And the book has given me the opportunity to, to, to explain, explain yeah. those things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so then, so if we hearken them back to 1980, you take over. Yeah. A year later, you're compelled in some ways to, uh, to fire uh, Dave Sexton. Um, four trophyless seasons, I believe it was, and obviously fans probably growing impatient. It, it, it was then rumoured that Brian Clough might have been one of the candidates. Obviously, we all know in the end you plump for Ron Atkinson. Yeah. Um, but at the time, you outruled that as a possibility, I believe, Brian Clough had. Brian Clough came into the thinking. I don't know why at the time, maybe... Um, uh, I just don't know, but I mean, there were three other choices before Ron Atkinson, and uh, it's quite clear. I approached Laurie McMenemy first of all, and Laurie said that he was interested, almost intimated he was going to come, yeah. and then for some reason he didn't, and I think it's because his wife didn't, the children were at school in Southampton or education in Southampton, she didn't want to move north and didn't want to move the children. Mm -hmm. That was the explanation he gave. I then approached... Um, uh, Bobby Robson, who was at Ipswich at the time, and he said that his loyalty was uh, w was there, and he didn't want to to, to move, which which I fully respected. And then uh, Ron Saunders, and then I got the message that uh, that uh, through a journalist that uh, Ron Atkinson was desperate for the job. I'd probably come round to Ron anyway by then after after the other three. So, you know, we were desperate for him. But Brian Clough, for some reason at the time, and I can't remember why, Brian Clough was not in the frame at any stage. Right. And yeah. So that was probably just paper that was just paper yeah, talk. Yeah, it must have been at the time, yeah. And 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 before we sort of move on to that as well, lots of questions come into me as I'm asking. So I'm trying to intersperse several here. But I suppose the way you were covered by the press during your time as um, and you alluded to it before with the, with the the increase in scrutiny with which the kind of media have covered football, the way you were covered even as a chairman by the press during your tenure, it, it was almost it was unlike any other chairman really in world football. Did, did that really attest to the, the 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 size and the stature of Manchester United? The fact that people were even interested in the chairman. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I mean, I, I was 
my big failure, I think, was was PR. I was never a great fan of, of, of PR. I'm a bit old-fashioned in the sense that, that I think that if somebody's doing the job well enough, do you need PR? Whereas nowadays, I think I've come around to the fact that probably you do need PRs, particularly today. I mean, you, you know, politicians today, it's, it's, all, it's all PR, isn't it? Whereas you go back to people like Winston Churchill. I mean, Winston Churchill wouldn't have been interested in PR at all. You know, you know, I do it this way and I do it. It's either right or wrong, but, you know, all the rest of it. So it's a different era today. But, but I probably should have taken on some PR guidance along the way. But I didn't, and I think I suffered from it because I always ignored it and just thought, well, if I'm doing things right, it'll all come right and, and, and all the rest of it. And, and it generally, it did, but it didn't, but, but to the extent of my, my image suffered as, 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 as a result of it as well. If I had people to explain the things I've been able to explain in the book at the time, yeah. rather than now, you know, 20 years later or whatever, yeah. it, might, it might have been better received. So I do accept that, 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 that PR was, was my downfall, and I wasn't particularly interested. I didn't like the idea of having to explain everything to a PR man no. to go and tell people. I preferred to do it myself. I was approachable. If somebody wanted to know something, I would tell them, but I'd tell them in a very sort of matter of fact without thinking about the consequences of it, just tell it the way it was. Yeah. And it didn't always read the right, or, or, or wasn't always interpreted the right way. Yeah. But, but like you say, I think that was probably a the time yeah yeah purely down to the era and 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 part of the charm really of, of the era was that it wasn't as um pr wasn't as readily uh tapped into but now uh, you've had the chance to kind of to, to be transparent in the book like you mentioned there and yeah. um yeah and and i suppose then so we get to 1981 with the sexton big ron comes in um you know that that was a i suppose a period that was in a way fruitful 83 and 85 FA Cups I was I was born in 83 I was at the 83 Cup final but in the hotel next to Wembley my dad took me down my mum stayed in the hotel room with me so he could go to the game so that was my first FA Cup indirectly though the first one I was at was 90 um so uh, big Ron's tenure I mean it was it was sort of you know it was successful with the FA Cup didn't quite get there with the league we know we had a 10 game uh, unbeaten at the start didn't we won, won 10 games and then 85 now I think Ron's period was a bit like Tommy Dock's it was exciting um, but you never quite felt that we were quite a league winning side and I think with 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 Ron two great cup runs there um, and, and obviously winning the FA Cup was, was, was still big in those days. It was bigger in those days than it is today, actually, the, the FA Cup. Yeah. We were never out of the top four. Mm -hmm. We qualified for Europe every year he was there. So Ron was, was, certainly wasn't a failure. But at the end, I think the, uh, you know, when, when, when we finally made the decision, we were 19th in the league. We'd started the season badly. And I think Ron, uh, it was the worst time of his tenure, at the end, yeah. you know, what I mean, after after four or five good seasons, um, I just felt that we were going backwards rather than forwards, mm -hmm. and I couldn't see 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 us winning the league yeah. under Ron. So, decided to make the change. Yeah. The, the question of, well, we all know Sir Alex then comes in, but before we get there, within the first sort of several years of your tenure at United, you've had to. You've had to sack two managers. Yeah. Ultimately, as the chairman, that decision will will lie with yourself, um, and, and you're the one that presumably has to do it. How hard is that? Just for, well, <laughs> to, to actually. Well, it's not easy. I mean, I mean, I mean, um, different in a way. I mean, I, my father had been with um, Dave Sexton for three years, and I only had Dave for one and a bit, one seasons. You know, father died in February, yeah. so I had him to the end of the first season and the whole of the next season. So not a long time with Dave, but he, Dave was a lovely man. Yeah. He was. He was a very, very nice, very conscientious, very, very... And I think that it was a big shock to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it was hard. It was, it was hard. With Ron... Slightly different because I think and Dave was never bitter. You know what I mean. I, I went to his funeral. And I saw his wife there and everything else. And I always stayed. You know, he used to come to matches. Was always very chatty and all the rest of it. 
With regards to, to Ron, I think, I'm not saying it was easy sacking him, it, cert it certainly wasn't. But Ron had had good, a good five, I'd been with Ron for five years, and I think Ron had had a good, good five years. It was only at the end that it went wrong. Um, and and, and he seemed, Ron seemed to accept it. He did seem to uh, accept it. And uh, again, I've always kept good relations with, with Ron. And I think Ron, for five years, did a good job. I've always said that. I, you know, yeah. I didn't feel he was a, a failure in any way. And I think he was a good stepping stone in his life, probably the highlight of his career. And he went on to other things as well. I mean, he won two League Cups, one with Sheffield Wednesday, one with Villa. So he, he went on to have another, another good career. Yeah. And, and, and we were part of his, part of his career. Um, you know, and, and I have fond memories of it. Absolutely, and then the, the the big decision to bring in Alex Ferguson, and um, <clears throat> I suppose the the obvious question at the time: what was the the, the key criteria, or, or in your thinking, the rationale um, we're bringing Alex in? I mean, at the time, maybe not everyone's obvious choice. I suppose. Yeah. I think the the the. the, the the choice of Alec was, was, was fairly easy because I'd, I'd sort of got to know Alec when we sold Gordon Strachan, so I knew Alec. Uh, I'd followed his career at Aberdeen, and, and what he'd done there was quite amazing, really. When you think he won three leagues, and, and you know, ahead of Rangers and Celtic, two big clubs in Scotland, and the size of Aberdeen. And, of course, he won four Scottish FA Cups as well, so seven domestic honours out, I think a League Cup as well. But also, I think the thing that put Alec on the map was winning the European Cup Winners' Cup in '83, yeah. particularly beating Real Madrid mm -hmm. in the final. So he proved that he could take a, a small Scottish club, make them champions, and compete at European level, yeah. and particularly to beat the might of, of Real Madrid in the final. So that, you know, I think he was on our radar. Um, and, and, and when we decided to make the change, he was the, the obvious, obvious choice. You know, because Manchester United qualified even those days, even under Ron. Every year we qualified for Europe. But of course, in '85, English clubs got banned, yeah. so we weren't in Europe for four years. But nevertheless, we knew that that ban was going to end one day. So we're picking a manager who we think can also be successful in Europe as well, particularly if we're going to qualify, whether it's the UEFA Cup or Cup Winners' Cup or the Champions League yeah. or, the, or the European Cup, as it was in those days. Yeah. And you, you know, you, you picked your man and, you know, you really, you, I won't say you persevere because it, it sounds very negative, but at the end of the day, there was, there were, there were periods during. Word, well, yeah. Okay. I think we did. I think we did persevere because um, it wasn't happening in the, the, the early, uh, early years. We knew, or we still, we never lost faith because we knew, um, what Alec was trying to do at, at, at the ground floor level. Uh, he wasn't happy with the scouting. He felt that, that Manchester City was ahead of us in the scouting. He felt that there weren't enough scouts. The scouts weren't doing the job well enough. We weren't getting enough youngsters. City were getting more of the uh, youngsters, at that, the better youngsters at that time. So he completely revamped the scouting. He was obviously very keen with the junior teams and with Archie Knox, who was also important in those early years. Uh, he was a great help to, to Alec in sorting teams out and coaches and getting the young the teams to play. So we, we knew how, how hard he was working. And of course, the, 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 the season that, that everybody refers to 90 season we bought five new players that season yeah. and you know you buy new players they don't automatically just come storming in the first team and become an immediate overnight success no. it's a big club united they've got to get used to playing in front of the crowds they've got to get used to the pressure of being a Manchester United player and some of them take longer than others no. so we were, we, were, we were bedding players in no. and, they, and some of them took time to gel so there's no point in supporting a manager yeah. with a host of new players and then before he even has a chance to, to, uh, to wed them into the team, sacking him. Yeah. So we were, we were very anxious to keep him, to give him a chance to, to get that success. And of course that cup run mm -hmm. and, and allowed him to do that. And of course when he went on to Wembley mm -hmm. and we won, that then lifted the pressure off everybody, particularly me yeah. as, as chairman. And then, of course, the Cup Winners' Cup the following year, and then the League Cup, and then, yeah. as you know, it just, it just accumulated.
Absolutely, yeah, yeah thankfully. Yeah. And um, <laughs> um, and that, patient. Yeah, that's yeah. We, it was all to do with patience and 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 and, and just believing that that we had got the right man, but but hoping like hell he was going to prove it to us. Yeah, yeah. And and because as I sort of alluded to it before, that was my first FA Cup final there, nineteen ninety. Happy yeah. days. I didn't make the Lee Martin replay. I was there for the three all. But I mean, a two two part question regarding Sir Alex. I mean. Like you say, yeah, persevere and you, and you persisted with him. And how did you? Because that doesn't, obviously, as you know, it doesn't keep the baying fan. You know, the the, the shall we say that the sullen fans at bay. If they're, you know, there's the, the famous Tara Fergie and, and the, the kind of banner and you know fans calling for his head. How were you able to communicate the more nuanced? sort of rationale you had for persevering with Sir Alex, the idea that he was doing things behind the scenes. How were you able to sort of, so we say, appease the fans well, though, for those I years? Wasn't. I wasn't, and I don't think I did. And it comes probably comes back to the PR side of it. Yeah. Uh, again, there wasn't a lot coming back from the club, only support to Alec himself yeah. and, 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 and not make any decisions, negative decisions in, in getting rid of him. Yeah. But there wasn't a lot of communication. We got a lot of, I used to get a lot of letters. I used to reply to the letters, yeah. you know, but all I could say was that, you know what I mean, yeah. you know, I hear what you say, but, you know, he's working very hard and we've just bought these players and hope, we hope it's going to come good. So I replied to all the personal letters yeah. But I didn't go out and sort of, and, I, and I'm not sure that, that sometimes chairman used to go out and give a, a vote of confidence in a manager. And, and, and really, it's a death knell because, you know, they say, oh, he's on his way out with chairman's had to give a, a vote of confidence or whatever. Yeah. So I steered away from, from votes of confidence. Um, but I did answer the private letters. And, 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 and all I could do was just hope and pray that it turned around sooner rather than later because... I've always been honest and said that although I supported him that season mm -hmm. and I told him that, that his job wasn't on the line at Forest away, mm -hmm. I don't know whether if we'd, if we'd gone out of the cup that game mm -hmm. and our league position hadn't improved, how long more I could have gone on supporting him, I don't know. And I've always been honest about that. Right. You know what I mean? It, it may have come the day when you've, we'd have had to say, well, hang on, you know, I, I've, I've supported you the best I can, but, but you know, it's not getting any better. Thank God for Mark Robbins. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but but it, yeah, it, yeah, Mark Robbins and 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 the whole cup run really. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. yeah. It is. yeah. Well, that's fascinating. You say that as well, and and do you think? <clears throat> I think people look back on it in retrospect as well because of the the dramatically different landscape nowadays, and we've seen it with United obviously since Sir Alex. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, David Moyes only been given several months, and yeah. Louis Van Gaal two years. I mean, do you believe Sir Alex? If you'd have come in now, I mean, it's a dramatically different club as well. So in a way, it's a very diff. It's a hard. It's yeah. it's it's almost a moot question. But he wouldn't have been. Really would he have been given that time? Players support him in the current environment, and I, I can honestly say I, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have my doubts, mm -hmm. but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. You say that I've never actually. I've never heard you say that. You, you, so you never actually came close to um, removing Sir Alex from his position, but you don't know if you would have, it would have been tenable thereafter. Right. Yeah, the pressure would have grown and grown and grown. It was bad enough as it was, yeah. but it would have got worse. But that cut run lifted, lifted the pressure. Yeah. It still was probably still there at the end of the season, but it lifted the pressure. And then, of course, with the Cup Winners' Cup run the following season mm -hmm. and going all the way and, win and winning it, yeah. Uh, and then the following season, you know, well, the following season we should have won the league, mm -hmm. and we didn't. But we yeah. won the league cup. Yeah. But we should have won it. We should have won it that year. Yeah. But 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 by then he was established. You know what I mean? He, yes. he was established as, as as a winner, really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I suppose a bit of doom and gloom there. But now on to the the, I suppose the um, the fruitful period and, and where the kind of the culmination, the materialisation of all that yeah. that kind of foundations. Um, your personal highlight, I suppose, of what was just a decade of riches in, in terms of being a Manchester United fan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the 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 first thing was winning the league mm -hmm. because you know to go twenty six years a club the size of Manchester United and Liverpool are going through that now, aren't they? I mean, it's 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 it's, it's unbelievable, really. 
Um, you know, if in 1990, when Liverpool won their last league, if you said, you know, here we would be now, yeah. in 2017, they wouldn't, they haven't won a, a league since, you wouldn't have believed it, would you? No. Same as in 1967, when we won the trophy, you say, well, it'll be 26 years before we do this again. You probably would have stopped watching them. A lot of supporters would have said, well, no point watching them then, you know what I mean? Wow. It's just the way it went. That was absolutely huge in 93, mm. winning, winning the league. That lifted, again, the pressure again, uh, a different kind of pressure, because the pressure before that was 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 not winning anything. We won the FA Cup. We then go on to win, start winning trophies, but the league was still something that we had to crack, yeah. and Alex needed to win that as well, also, yeah. and and it took him seven years, four years to win a trophy, seven years to win the league. Once he'd done that, then that was ready. We were off then. Yeah. We were off. We never looked back then. Uh, certainly not in my time anyway yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely and, and it's well documented that during your time at United as well several transfer fee record, records were broken yeah. um, you know we're, we're going to Brian Robson starting off with Brian Robson then yeah, Robson, the, the, Pallister. Pallister and obviously Keane. the sale of Mark Hughes yeah. Keane and, Keane, and um, yeah. several York. York, yeah, all, yeah. all records, weren't they? Yeah, yeah all records. And record for a defender, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Does, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we were investing in the team. I wanted to know, when you took over in 1980 as chairman, in, in your wildest dreams, I mean, I know as a, as a successful businessman in your own right outside of United, yeah. did you did you ever foresee that the, the global juggernaut that it could become did you always have that belief that underlying belief that with a little bit of success you could you know catapult yourself onto that level well what what i believed was that that, that my my ambition was always to become number one in england mm. be uh, you know and and you've got to become number one or you had to in those days you had to become number one to compete in europe because in those days only the champions went in and it was always my ambition to, to win the league and then to go on and win what was then the European Cup. Yeah. Uh, you know, doubles and trebles you don't sort of think of. You know what I mean? You just think in terms of being, being the champion, winning the odd FA Cup, being the champion, but trying to win the European Cup. Because my father had done it and I wanted to emulate what he'd done. Yeah. He'd won an FA Cup, he'd won the league and he'd won the European Cup. Never all three in one season, but, you know, <laughs> over time. So I always wanted to make Manchester United League champion, champions. And then hopefully, as a result of that, to go on and win the European Cup. But what I didn't know when I took over was that by 19, within 12 years, the Premier League would have started. And then on Premier League, the back of Sky. And then the whole promotion of the game. And then the expansion of the... Champions League to include more clubs and the money that then came into the game through television and winning the Champions League big league champions and 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 commercialize the commercial side of it to visualize all that no you know what I mean that was that you know it'd be easy for me to say yes but yeah. being honest no yeah. uh, but I did I did visualize winning the league I did visualize winning the European Cup but the big thing was for me was the formation of the Premier League yeah. which took nine years and again it's, it's in the book yeah. we started in 1983 mm -hmm. there were various negotiations along the way before we got to the Premier League mm -hmm. where income was improved and we could keep a bigger share of the TV money bigger share of the gate receipts bigger share of sponsorship and all that. various negotiations took place but in 83 it really started which started what ended with the Premier League in 92 nine years once the Premier League started and the TV money started to roll in mm -hmm. particularly when Sky was formed and Sky got interested the amount of money and that coincided also with Manchester United floating building the Stretford end becoming, cham becoming champions mm -hmm. uh, uh, all coincided at the same time yeah. and that's when the bubble really but that's when, when it suddenly became global yeah yeah yeah. yeah, and we were in a position to capitalise on it, and that's what we did. We became very commercial, and we got a lot of criticism for being commercial. You said before about about being criticised for being money orientated or, or whatever else, or being too business minded rather than football minded. Yeah. But you need 
You need that to take, to take, to take United to what it became. Yes. We needed the money. We needed the bucket. We needed to be paid from TV and sponsorship what we were worth because yeah. that gave us the clout to build, to get the players, to go out and buy the best, to, bait the, to keep breaking the British record transfer fee, yeah. to keep ploughing money into the stadium. In my time, we spent £114 million yeah. on the stadium. And that's why the stadium is, is like it is today. Yeah. But you have to create that money to do it. And we built, the, we built we bought Carrington. I bought Carrington for a few hundred thousand pounds. Mm. But then we spent 14 million on, on, on the pitches and making it, and, 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 uh, making it what it is. And yeah. since then, they've spent more. So it's the whole combination of, 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 of interests and success and, 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 and making things happen. And were you, uh, did you always feel then it was inevitable or, or almost were you at peace with the fact that you had to be the in your position as chairman? You were okay if the fans didn't love you necessarily, and they and they lauded or, or idolised Sir exactly. Alex. You were okay with being the man behind exactly, the scenes. Exactly that. That never particularly uh, bothered me. Yeah. As long as long as we were making the money, as long as we were developing the stadium, as long as we were buying the right players, and we were being successful, then the whole operation was a success. And and I, and as much as anything, I'm a fan as well. I want the club to do. I, I, I still want the club to do well. You know what I mean? I, you know, as a fan, you want to be winning games. You want to see the best players. You want to be winning trophies when you actually own it, even more so. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, so of course, of course, I wanted it to be a success. And, and if I had to make unpopular decisions, like like maybe not getting who he wanted or whatever, or you know, then then so be it. At the, at the end of the day, we're working towards a dream. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And. With regards to the players, well, I touched upon it earlier. Obviously, you would have you would have had an integral role in the negotiations of contracts, but also recruitment of players. I suppose the one, the most famous anecdote would have, of course, been the, the, the Eric Cantona one, for example, and, and yeah. how that all transpired. But before you sort of touch upon that, was there any other negotiations that maybe fell through at the last minute? That, that I mean. Gaza one and things like that, but uh, they all documented in there. I mean, the Lineker one, we had the chance with Lineker and, and, and uh, Ron felt that we already had four strikers, so we didn't go for him. Uh, the Gaza one, we thought we had uh, in the bag and suddenly Tottenham came in with a few additional offers at the end and we lost him. Shearer, uh, again, we thought we were uh, prime for Shearer. We thought we were in the best position and uh, I negotiated the contract with the Shearer's agent, Stevens, and Alec had spoken to Shearer, and for all sense and purpose, he was coming. But I understand that, that Jack Walker wouldn't let him come, and it was over his dead body, and Shearer thought of Jack a bit like a father figure, didn't want to upset him, and Jack was happy for him to go to Newcastle, but not to come to us, and all the rest of it. So there was a lot in the background on that one, but we lost that one. So, yeah, there was, there was ones we lost... Uh, along the way that we you know we would have liked and, and just generally regarding um, negotiations or buying players do you, when you certainly when you started at United I imagine the process of buying a player was a lot less protracted I, I imagine it was a much simpler process it was, it was. I mean there was less agents in those days I mean I think the first agent I dealt with was well actually it was quite early on but it was a solicitor acting for Frank Stapleton mm. Um, so in the early days, agents tended to be professional accountants or solicitors. But I remember Brian Robson had an accountant, you know what I mean, as his, his agent. So they tended to be solicitors or accountants, probably more accountants than solicitors. But then, of course, you got, then got professional agents coming in who were not necessarily accountants, whatever, uh, you know, but are looking to make... Uh, make money out of out of doing deals for players and things. So that has all changed. Um, and it wasn't, in the early days, it wasn't as, as, as uh, protracted as it is as it is now. But it was, became more protect, protracted as, as years went by. So by the end, I was getting involved with agents and having to agree payments with them and all the rest of it, whereas I wasn't at the beginning. An agent would be acting on behalf of the player and I didn't know what arrangement the player had with the solicitor or the accountant. And did you grow increasingly frustrated at the process? Well, yeah, but also I, I also had a bit of a rule of thumb where, you know, I felt with an agent, if an, if an agent bought a player, say, for, and I signed a five-year contract, 
player signed a five-year contract, I felt if the agent got two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, fifty thousand a year after that, he was doing bloody well. Mm-hmm. So you know what I mean. I sort of said, you know, to put a big contract, a big contract. I'm talking about a few million, yeah. two hundred and fifty thousand to the agent was was to me was enough. Yeah. Nowadays, to about tens of millions to the agent. So it has changed completely. But I didn't. I wouldn't have that. Mm-hmm. But maybe it was easier for me to be resistant to that in my day. Yeah. It, nowadays, there's more pressure on getting the player from different sources, so maybe they have to allude to higher agents' fees or not ever. But I find some of the agents' fees very... Uh, I find them horrific, to be honest. Yeah. And I think it's just money going out of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And... and- is there any player that hasn't been because, like you said before, the, the the very famous one, Shearer and and Gaza and the players that we was there ever a player that you felt you were close to signing? Maybe that isn't well documented, that never made it quite as readily to the press. No, I think I think I've documented everything in 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 in, in the book that, yeah. that, that that was important. Yeah, right. yeah. And um, I suppose then with just Sir Alex, how would you categorise your relationship with him over the years? Because obviously he's a very strong-minded character and you're both winners in your in your realm um was it I mean, it couldn't have always been rosy of course no most of the time it was i mean the press tried to make out that there were problems with 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 alec and i but i mean at, at the end of the day I, I don't think there were and if there were then so be it it still didn't alter the the success but i don't think there the, the, the was the in the early days, I spent a lot more time with Alec, mm-hmm. and I probably needed to do them because you know we were both trying to build something up that was going to be successful. Mm-hmm. Once we floated in '91, I had less time then. I had to more responsibilities, mm-hmm. particularly to the city. Mm-hmm. You know, once you float, you've got a responsibility then to share. You've got more shareholders. You've got institutional shareholders. Mm-hmm. You've got to be, you know, au okay with them. Bring them on board go to presentations, you've got the stock exchange to deal with, that has another responsibility and all the rest of it. So although the finan- you've got the financial director there to help you on those things, you've, you know, you've got more, more, more responsibility. Mm-hmm. Also, um, we, when we floated, we expanded as well. We built up the merchandising, we set up a separate company. I brought in Edward Friedman. I had to spend more time with him mm-hmm. building up the merchandising and all the rest of it. The catering became bigger. The club generally grew and grew. Yeah. And I had more people answerable to me. So I spent less time with Alec in the latter years than I did with the, in the formative years. Mm-hmm. But I was always there if you wanted to buy a player or wanted to sell a player and I had to do the negotiation, I was there. Same with the personal terms, the contracts, I was always, always there. So I don't think Alec lost out on that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And at the end of the day, I judge it by how successful we were. Yeah. We became more successful commercially, mm-hmm. but also the team became more successful as well. Yeah. So, so you know what I mean? So, so whatever, whatever it was, whatever formula we had yeah. between us actually worked yeah. and was very successful. Yeah. And when I stepped down in, in, in 2003, mm-hmm. we just won our eighth Premiership title in 11 years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, 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 it proves in the pudding. Two doubles, a treble, you know what I mean? It, it, it was there. So, you know what I mean? Did, did you ever, was there ever, um, did Sir Alex ever come to you wanting a player? I mean, I, I imagine in terms of the footballing um criteria you would always defer to Sir Alex on that one but on evaluation did he ever come to you and say because you obviously were you were breaking records all the time but did he ever come and say I value him at this we're willing to pay that but you weren't willing to pay a certain fee the only player I could ever remember um, not supporting him on uh, was was Batistuta that was because of Batistuta's personal terms Alec came to me with the offer or saying that Batistuta wanted to join But I can't remember what it was, but it was was talking in terms of net. And by the time you added the tax and all the rest of it, he was a player that would have completely smashed our wage structure. Because I always had a wage structure. You know, I mean, obviously that varied. And as you brought more and more high worth players in, Mm -hmm. 
it rose. You know what I mean? Mm. But I always tried to keep some sort of control on the top wage because as soon as you bring a, a player in, and a fine example um, was uh, in 2002 when we bought um, the Argentinian. Oh, uh, uh, in 2002, Veron? Veron, yeah. yeah. And now Veron suddenly came in on a wage of five million. Mm. We hadn't got anybody on that at all. Mm. And it was Peter Kenyon's first year as chief exec. I was still chairman of the football club. Yeah. Now, I wasn't in favour of that because I knew that that would break the wage structure because suddenly Keane, Cole, mm. Beckham, Skulls, Giggs, they would all, you know, they all find out what players are on. Yeah. And suddenly if you bring somebody in that, that smashes the wage bill, then it you'll find that sooner or later the whole thing lifts, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was always one for keeping some sort of lid on. It, it, was, it, it was a moving feast, it always, you know what I mean? It, it, it never went down, mm. it always went up, but it went up in a controlled fashion. Yeah. So, uh, so I just, you know, I controlled it that, that, that way really. I forget where we started this. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. No, the, uh, about whether you uh, disagreed yeah. on that. Yeah. So, so it was Battistute. Yeah. So, so I just felt that at the time, Battistute coming in would have absolutely smashed that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I didn't support him on it. Yeah. And then, just sort of now touching upon the, the latter part of your tenure at United. Um, okay, the, the, the obvious, I suppose one of the obvious landmark uh, events would have been the B Sky B, as you correctly yeah. pointed out before. Um, at the time, the the criticism that was levelled that you probably as well due to the you know the actual source with it being B Sky B and maybe yeah. the unpopularity of Murdoch. Yeah. Um, it's still a decision that you stand by, isn't it? That you would have would have sold. Well, yeah, but not just me. I mean, uh, when you get a situation where somebody wants to buy, where we were a public company by then, yeah. when you get a situation where you get a, a, a bid, and it wasn't a hostile bid, it was a friendly bid in the sense that they would only do it if the board supported it. Right. So, what, you know, the big difference between a friendly bid and a hostile bid. Yeah. So it was a friendly bid. I put it to the other directors. Roland Smith was, was keen on it from the start. Because he felt that, that, that um, it, the backing of B Sky B, the financial backing of B Sky B, made us stronger and more powerful, as I did. Mm. And then the other directors slowly but surely came on board. Even David Gale, the finance director. By the end, when we accepted that bid, the last person to accept the bid was Greg Dyke, because mm -hmm. he felt that the value of TV would be greater in the long term and on a. Uh, and he felt that the, the bid was was a bit short in terms of the the amount they were offering. Mm -hmm. Everybody else accepted it. Um, I wasn't too bothered about the the size of the bid, whether it was two hundred and thirteen um, pound a share or two forty. Didn't make any difference to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I wasn't interested in the personal wealth side of it. I was interested in in whether B Sky B would make us more powerful, mm -hmm. whether it would help us win more honours, give us more money to spend on players. Makers. So, to me, the bid was never about the amount of money, but to some directors it was. Mm -hmm. uh, others were sort of thinking about their jobs and all the rest of it. Would they still be retained in B Sky B and all the rest of it? But at the end of the day, when the board accepted the offer of 240p a share, it was unanimous board decision to accept the offer. It wasn't my decision whether I supported it or not. I was one of several directors who's, who supported it. Yeah. But, of course, it all came back. On me. Yeah. If you're asking me, do I believe that that, that was a good deal? Uh, yes, I did. I did think it was a good deal. And I, and I still believe to this day that Sky taking over Manchester United would not have been a bad thing for Manchester United. Yeah. And thereafter. And soon oh, after, yeah. we did get taken over, didn't we? We got taken over by, you know, a hostile bid. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the way it goes. And sort of then after 99, between that period, 99 sort of 2003 when you left um i mean how would you characterize the last few years at united is, is it something really towards the end where you were ready to walk away did you feel ready to walk away well in a way um in uh, 97 i bought david gill on board as finance director and then later on that year i think that was in january later on that year uh, i'd asked peter kenyon to come in he was leaving um, uh, Umbro and I felt that he would be a good 
chief exec for the future. So I brought him in on the basis that I would step down in 2000. Mm -hmm. So I'd already made the decision in 97, really. I was 52 then. Uh, I, I was 55 in 2000s. And I thought, well, by then I'll have done 20 years. Uh, I felt that Peter was the right man to take over. So I'd invited him in as deputy chief exec. So I'd really... I'd have been going back on my word if I didn't step down in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so I was ready. So, I, sorry, I had made the decision. Was I ready at the time? Uh, probably when 2000 came, there was, a, there was a few regrets and all the rest of it. But by then, Roland Smith was talking about stepping down, and I'd had a very good relationship with Roland Smith as chairman of the PLC. Yeah. I was chairman of the football club. He was chairman of the PLC. Yeah. I was chief exec good relationship with him, supported me all the way. He was going to step down anyway mm -hmm. in 2001, 2002, I can't remember. And uh, the new, uh, they appointed the new chairman, the uh, uh, chairman of Ch uh, British Gas. And when Peter took over as chief exec and I was chairman, mm -hmm. the, new chief, the new chairman of the PLC alluded more to Peter as chief exec of the right. group than he did to me as chairman of the football club. So I was getting marginalised a little bit anyway. Right. And I just felt that... I, and I'd had an agreement when I stepped down as chairman that whenever I stepped down... Sorry, when I stepped down as chief exec, I had an agreement with the two chairmen, the old the chairman, Sir Roland Smith, and the new chairman, mm -hmm. that if ever I stepped down as chairman of the football club, mm -hmm. I would go to club president. Yeah. So I knew I had that there. So I just felt the time was right, really. Because yeah. because you know Peter was becoming more important to the new chairman and all the rest of it, and then um, as I, I, when I did that, mm -hmm. Peter then got poached by Chelsea anyway, and David Gill became chief exec. So it all changed. It all changed about the same time. Yeah. yeah. And and how would you characterise your? I suppose your relationship with Sir Alex when you left was it? Did you leave? The role on good terms, I suppose, because obviously, like you said, it generally during your tenure, it was it was rosy yeah, and well, it didn't affect Alec because I just I, I, I'd been. You're talking about now when I stepped down as chairman of the, of the football club. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, just yeah, in, no, in terms. I mean, it didn't that didn't affect Alec really because yeah, he, he was answering Peter Key. He was dealing more with Peter Kenyon anyway. Right. I was chairing the football club yeah. at board meetings. Yeah. And, and I was also representing the uh, football club at the Premier League meetings in London and things, right. along with Peter. Yeah. So so it didn't affect Alec in the sense that, that just a new chairman took over of the meetings. Right. Okay. Somebody else chaired the meetings. Right. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it didn't really affect Alec by then. Yeah. And your current day relationship then, do, do you have a relationship with Sir Alex yeah, now? Is it something? Oh yeah, I see him on match days now, just, yeah. you know, but in the same way, he's actually still on the board, but I'd, I don't think they have board meetings very often nowadays. Yeah. I think it's run from the lazies in America, right. but he's still on the on the board. All I am is honorary club president. So yeah. we just, we sit both sit in the director's box. We both have a meal in the same lounge before matches so it's just you know how i earn occasionally cordial. yeah cordial yeah. yeah 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 lovely and um i suppose then the, the the question now is regarding to the role that you assumed directly after yeah. uh, stepping down as chairman in 2003 that the president role yeah. an honorary role i mean of course you've discussed as well in the book about obviously less pressure now you can be yeah. you can genuinely just be a fan yeah. um However, is there still a part of you where, because you still you've got that title at the club and you're involved, and certainly post Sir Alex, you know it's all relative, isn't it? And, and younger fans won't remember days where things were more barren. But in this rel relative period of adversity that we've gone through post Sir Alex, have you always been there, or have you made yourself available, or are you available if someone would have wanted to ask for your yeah, advice? To ask me as president, of course I would have been been available. Yeah. Um, funny enough, David Gill used to consult me every now and again. David would. Well, I used to chat to David. I got on well with David. I appointed David, yeah. so I've always got on well um, 
with David, and and David every now now and again would come and just sit, you know, on a match day, come and have a chat or whatever. So you know, and over over time, he consulted me on one or two things. He was very much his own man, yeah. but every now and again, he'd ask me something or whatever. And uh, but then the new regime, but then I'm twice removed from the new regime. Regime, they'd probably go to David now right. if they needed, if 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 they wanted to talk. Yeah. But if they wanted to, I'd certainly be available you know at any time but it, it doesn't happen so say, such a wealth of yeah. knowledge and you know even on on Matt, you, you are a presence at the ground yeah. whether, you're there whether they discuss it with david i don't know i don't know but david, david and i still talk you know what i mean and david's still on the board yeah yeah, yeah. and um as i say in terms of being a fan now as well like you say you go to the games and you can enjoy it in that capacity just your just a very brief synopsis of united post sir alex um, just talking about that, um, Edward Woodward read the book, right. and he said to me, he said he thoroughly enjoyed it. Right. Now, Brilliant. what that be, I don't know, but he, he said he enjoyed it. So, right. yeah, be interesting. Yeah. Brilliant. So maybe you know, on a match day, he'll come over. You know, you could have a. It'd be yeah, it'd be interesting if he came to consult you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll see. <laughs> Very good. Right. Um, yeah, just to say, in terms of United post Sir Alex, your synopsis of, I suppose, how the club's been run. You know, off the pitch as well. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a different era now. It's it you know it's it's totally different ownership, different era, new people. Um, you know, I, all I want is the club to succeed, to carry on. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think they've had the difficulties. Um, obviously, David Moyes didn't quite work out the way people would have wanted. Uh, probably neither Van Gaal. The Van Gaal lasted two years. He did win the FA Cup. But I can't say it was the most enjoyable viewing. Um, I, was, I was a little bit disappointed with some of the football that was played. I think under the new manager Mourinho, there's a lot more hope. But And I think he did well last year. Um, I think winning two cups and getting us into the Champions League was a successful first season. Uh, I think he's under a bit of pressure this year to do a bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how that works out. But generally, I think there's a bit m more renewed hope. And, and 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 I personally wish him all the best because if he's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and do do you, if we sat here again, say in three years' time, do you a believe we'll have won the Premiership by then? I mean, that's a fairly um, most United fans will be unhappy if we don't win it this year. I'm I'm a little bit more patient than that. But within a few years, and and do you think Mourinho's here for the long haul? Well, this I don't know because his, his track record is not 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 for the long haul, is it? Uh, I think three, four years maximum anywhere. But uh, but Manchester United's a bit different to most clubs, so let's hope that uh, he is here, because I, if he's here in three or four years, it means he has been successful along the way. Because I think even from his own point of view, if he's not successful, I'm not sure he will be around. So uh, I would be delighted if he's around in four years' time, because I think that will have signaled that we've, we've had a bit of success along the way. And do you enjoy that now? It must be very different when you go to a game on a match day. There is, if you go in purely to watch as a fan, the pressure. Do you enjoy that whole being able to just savour it more? Yes, I, I probably do. Because when you're involved in your, your chairman or, or, or big shareholder in the club or owner or whatever, you 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 do carry a bit more weight. You know, you you worry about the result more because you know the consequences of not getting a result. Yeah. When the you haven't got those financial pressures. You tend to just judge it just a little bit more on the football. And if you, you want to win, obviously, because you're a supporter, but if you don't win, you haven't got those financial consequences or, or, or you know, you, you don't necessarily lie awake that night thinking about, oh, blimey, what, what it means or all the, all the add-ons or all the, all, all the downside to, 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 to the result. So, uh, yeah, I, I go and I, I try and enjoy it as much as I can, but I still want them to win. I still get nervous, you know, and the last 10 minutes my knees are going. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, once a fan, always a fan. Do you not miss that sort of being privy to the everyday goings-on at the club? And what's... Well, I did miss it more at the beginning, but, of course, it's 17 years now since I, I stepped down as, as chairman. So it's it's got less over the years, but um, there are times when, I'm, when I, I, I miss parts of it, yes. Yeah. And last question as well, just before I ask you about one more about the book, and I appreciate the time today. I know I keep asking more, but um, 
the Glazers, can I just ask for your, because it's, it's fascinating to know your opinion on it, because by then, of course, you know, you were, you were president, but it, when they took over, what was your initial, uh, I suppose, perception of it all? And did you sympathise with the fans, I suppose, revolt, backlash against the whole thing? Well, I have difficulty with that because the fans, um, they, they didn't particularly like me. Mm. Uh, they didn't want B Sky B to take over. They didn't particularly like the float. They didn't like United being a PLC. Mm. And and then, of course, the Glazers came. They didn't particularly like the Glazers. So I don't know what, what, what the fans really, really wanted. You know what I mean? What, what, what really pleased them? So, uh, and I wasn't one to immediately jump to uh, conclusions with the Glazers. I felt, let's see what they do. Mm. And they have supported the managers of the day. Mm -hmm. They supported Alec, they supported David Moyes, they've actually supported Van Gaal, and they're now continuing to support Mourinho. I've always said you, you, you judge the Glazers when they actually leave the club, what, what position it's in yeah. when they leave it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, are they just going to strip it of all the, uh, the cash, pay off the debts, strip it of all the cash and sell it to the highest bidder, or are they going to leave the club in, 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 in a... Uh, a healthy financial position when they leave. And I think that's the time to judge them. I don't think you can criticise them for the support they've given to all the managers of the day. They have supported, and it's not, it's not through lack of funding that United hasn't been successful yeah. over the last few seasons. You know, when they've needed to buy, they've, they, they've bought. So let's, uh, let's wait and see. I, I reserve my judgment. Do you have a hunch on... on uh, that I outcome? Don't speculate, to be honest. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm president of the club, and they're the owners. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to the way that they've treated me and all the rest of it. And I, I just hope that they do the right thing at the right time. Yeah. And then, just tailing back to the book yeah. now, just just to end with, you've mentioned a couple of names there. Just then, you mentioned sort of Edward Wood messaging you about the book, and. Um, have you had any one that you've discussed in the book? Obviously, you'll have discussed the raft of players and managers, etc. Um, that's maybe been a little bit perturbed by anything, because obviously it's your candid account of what's gone on. Um, anyone that's subsequently, I don't know, been annoyed or made contact with you and said, "Oh, what are you writing that for?" Or uh, uh, generally, have you you gone away unscathed? Because a lot of people obviously end up offending someone when they write a, a memoir. Uh, no, I've not had any criticism at all. Um, I, I, the the only call I had from somebody I mentioned in the book was uh, was uh, Ron Atkinson, right. and Ron said, uh, "Was I suffering from dementia?" And I said, "Why? Why do you say that, Ron?" He said, "Well, he said when you mentioned Lineker, that that we were uh, that we were offered Lineker, and you said I had four forwards at the time." He said, uh, you mentioned one of them was Davenport. He said, we sold Davenport the year before. The one who should have been in the book was Alan Brazil. Right. So, <laughs> so that, that's the only one. He was, so that's the, uh, the, 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 only, uh, the only one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he wasn't critical. He was, he was more in joking yeah. actually about it, yeah. And, yeah. and when now you, I mean... Presumably, when you do bump into Reds in, in in the local village here or out and about Manchester, you know people say, "Oh, he, he kind of was the um, forgotten man during that period of success." In terms of, you know, people always obviously attributing everything to Sir Alex. But I presume you're well received when you're at the ground. Yes. And 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 I was going to say of, of fans that maybe have approached you since reading the book, or I know it's only early days, and it maybe in a few months, you know, people will approach you to talk about it what what is the thing that they all want to discuss with you the most I mean the obvious ones will be the Cantona signing and and uh, night and on the pitch things is there any elements of the book where someone's come up to you and said you know what um I'm quite surprised about that Martin or I didn't really I never realized that would be the case or tell me more about that story well people have come up and people say oh they didn't realize in the early days that it was uh, uh, such a struggle and people say that they didn't realize financially I got into so much debt personally before it all came good but people have said oh, oh I didn't I mean obviously the stories like the, the Lineker story yeah. um, the one or two st where we've missed out on players they didn't know about I mean one thing that people didn't know about was of course going for Arsene Wenger mm -hmm. uh, you know so yeah there have been things which 
have have come out in the book, which people which weren't public knowledge, yeah, uh, and and people have alluded to to those, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Curiosity, like curiously, Peter Schmeichel wrote wrote the foreword, didn't he, to the yes, book? How did that come about? Well, I see Peter every now and again. His son lives in Alderley, mm -hmm. uh, and I see his son in the supermarket. And uh, Peter goes to a restaurant uh, in Alderley sometimes, and he sees me having a coffee in the morning, which he said in the, it was quite accurate. He said yeah. it in his story. Mm -hmm. And he always comes over and shakes hands with all my friends and all the rest of it. And they all love him because they say he's so polite and he's, you know, he's courteous and polite and all the rest of it. So just one day, he was, uh, I was thinking, I was, originally I was going to ask Brian Robson to write the foreword, and I saw Peter one day, and it was just circumstances, really. He was there, and I was chatting to him. And I just said, oh, Peter, would you do me a favour? He said, what's that? I said, would you like to write the foreword to my book? He said, I'd be absolutely delighted to do it. Fantastic. And, and it, that's how it came about. Fantastic. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and one last question about other books as well. Like, So many footballers nowadays, managers write autobiographies. Has there ever been anything that you've read that's particularly amused you or annoyed you? Maybe that you've you've took umbrage to, you might have spoken to the player afterwards or is there anything that you've not liked over the years? Not really. I mean, there's always, there's always the odd, you read a book and, 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 and on football and if you're involved and you know it, there's always the odd mistake or the odd whatever, but there's nothing that's really sort of, uh, you know, re really annoyed me. I mean, everybody gets certain things wrong or certain conversations wrong or, or whatever. And it's all, at the end of the day, it's a matter, all a matter of interpretation and two people, in the same room can can interpret things differently can't they so but there's nothing there's nothing there but but i just felt that so many things had been written over the years on certain incidents where my interpretation was slightly different and this has given me the opportunity to put my side of it as, as i saw it yeah. that's yeah that's all i can say really absolutely well can't thank you enough for the time you've been an absolute gentleman to, to give you time this afternoon and it really is a, a fantastic really it's a must read really for any united fan out there uh, i think it's educational certainly for younger generation reds as well that want to know more about the club's history um it's a must read and like i say thank you so much for the time you, and it, inviting us to the, the very salubrious surroundings here in Alderley Edge, which is uh, for, for viewers maybe from further afield is a sort of a, an outpost of Manchester, more of a suburb here, but it's, it's lovely. Uh, and I can't thank you enough for the time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Brilliant.